Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, because you sent your Holy Spirit to illumine and to lighten our paths and to show us what you have for us in your word. Lord, we ask tonight that your word will become plain and clear to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then the grace to do the word. The grace to be obedient to your word, your grant unto us in Jesus' name. Because just as God spake to men in days gone by, so the Lord is speaking to all men today. And my brother, my sister, there is just one thing to do. Just obey. Just obey. Is the way God's way. When God speaks to us today, Lord, grant us the grace, the mind, the heart, the decision, the yieldedness, the surrender to obey you in all things. In Jesus' name, every verse of scripture, every statement of the scripture, Lord, we pray it will come directly to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. If our mansions fear you, sir. In that land beyond the sky, when time has passed away, there is but one thing to do, and faith and duty will tell you what you do. Just obey. Just obey. It's the way, God's way. Lord, we pray that today, the might to just obey, and the might to do your will, and the might to follow through everything you are teaching us tonight, Give to every one of us in Jesus' name. This passage of scripture that many people do not understand, show us the light tonight. We will understand. We will believe. We will accept. And we will walk according to this word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good amen before you sit down. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're actually studying from verse 23 to verse 26. But we're going to back up to verse 21 because there's a connection between verse 21, verse 22, and then verse 23. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raker, that means a non-entity, empty-headed fellow. Whosoever will use such a contemptuous language against his brother and say, Raker, he shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now we come to verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Those are the verses we're looking at today. As we look at the message today, talking about the necessity of reconciliation before acceptable service. The necessity of reconciliation before you can have 
acceptable service whatever the message to three parts number one realization at the altar of worship you come to the altar and you remember just right there that your brother has ought against you realization at the altar of worship number two reconciliation before acceptable worship reconciliation before acceptable worship number three reaction towards adversaries in the world now we come to point number one realization of the altar of worship matthew chapter five matthew chapter five we're reading from verse 23 in matthew chapter 5 verse 23 here are the words of jesus christ himself therefore if not bring thy gift to the altar and there remembrest that thy brother has ought against thee therefore if not bring thy gift to the altar and there at the altar you remember that your brother has ought against you i need to clear up that word brother because you know when we come to church we we'll say good morning brother or good morning sister and many times in our mind we limit that word brother and we do not understand how extensive that word brother is and so when it says therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there remembrest that thy brother has ought against thee and let's look at the way and that brother is used that brother in this passage and in many other passages would refer to christian brother as well as a neighbor a christian brother as well as a neighbor leviticus chapter 19 verse 17 leviticus chapter 19 and i'm reading from verse 17 thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart you understand that's not just talking about your brother is a christian it's your neighbor and then it says thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him it tells you the brother i'm talking about is a neighbor and so it's not just a christian brother in zechariah chapter 7 verse 10 your brother zechariah chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 10 still chasing this word the brother in verse 10 it says oppress not the widow whether christian widow or just just ordinary widow normal widow or the fatherless who are the christian they're not christian or the stranger christian or no christian or not the poor christian not christian let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart both christian and non-christian the brother so when it says when you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has ought against you it's not just about church man it's not just talking about the believer it's talking about a neighbor everyone around you matthew chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 3 and why beholdest the moat in thy brother's eye and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye but five thou hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye that's that's general your neighbor anybody you you want to correct anybody you want to say why are you doing this why are you doing that it says why are you looking at your brother like that look at yourself first and then correct what needs correction in your life in first thessalonians chapter 4 we're looking at the brother that it's not just your christian brother alone it means your brother your neighbor in first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 6 that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter is it all right to defraud a sinner to defraud uh, your co-tenant to defraud uh, an office worker which is not a christian no the brother there means everyone 
that none of us no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified First John chapter 2 in 1 John chapter 2 verse 9, He that says is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. The brother there means everyone, your neighbor, your brother, your Christian brother, or just your natural brother, anyone. It means your neighbor as well. We're not allowed to hate unbelievers. We're not allowed to hate sinners. In chapter 3 verse 15, 1 John 3 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. The brother there is everyone. Your brother, Christian brother, and your brother walking in the same place with you. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Chapter 4. In chapter 4 verse 20, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, that's a creature of God. Anyone God has created, that's your brother. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, his neighbor, everyone whom he has seen. Anybody you can see around, anybody you see at home, anybody you see in the office, anybody you see in the church, a brother, a neighbor, anyone, everyone, a creature of God and a new creature too. Then it says, for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Come back now to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Here it says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, thy gift to the altar natural gift there are some natural gifts we have we call them talents when you bring that gift to the altar there's some material gifts we have it may be money offering you bring your gift to the altar it may be our service our worship when you bring your gift to the altar in fact sometimes you just bring yourself and you offer yourself as a gift unto the Lord. And when you bring that gift unto the Lord, and there at the altar, you remember that thou rememberest that thy brother, thy neighbor, thy husband, thy wife, don't you mind her? She's overbearing and too demanding. Yes, but she has something against you. Don't you mind that child? That child is always naughty, but he has something against you. Don't you mind mommy? Mommy is always like that. And she complains about every little, little thing, but she has something against you. Don't you mind that co-tenant? He's never satisfied, but he has something against you. Don't you mind the landlord? He's always like that. At the end of the month, when he wants to collect his house rent, he doesn't see anybody's face, but he has something against you. That's your brother. I hey, don't mind, sister so-and-so. You know, she's always like that. Because maybe because she's not married yet. And you know, she, she doesn't have shock absorber. You have the shock giver. You too, you don't have shock absorber, but you know, you are the shock giver. And you say, she doesn't have any shock absorber. That's why she's acting like that. But she has something against you. Don't mind so-and-so, the director, the employer. They, they don't know that this amount of money is not enough. But they have something against you. Therefore, if not bring thy gift to the altar and there at the altar, remember it, that thy brother has ought against you. Has ought against you. Something happened between you. That the fellow is unhappy, sad, grieved. And because of that thing that happened, he's wondering, how can this man do something like this? this to me how can this lady do something like this to me 
This hurts me. This is bringing grief, sorrow, and sadness. It spoiled my day. And you can see from his reaction that he has ought against you. So the word of God says, you need to do something about it. At that time, where you remember that your brother has ought against you. Now this remembering, you know many times we don't remember what we ought to remember. All we remember is what we want. We don't remember what hurt he feels. We don't remember how unhappy she is. All we remember is what we want, what we like, what we appreciate, what we expect other people to do. That's all we remember. We don't remember the other man there. That lonely man there, that man that is even withdrawing from society, he feels everybody hates me. Nobody wants to see my face. Or not. Let me carry my face and go and hide it inside my room. Because of hurting. And you never remember your own part. All you remember is that man, he doesn't have what it takes to be able to move in society. But when you now remember, and if we're going to remember, we must be thoughtful, very thoughtful. You know, if you are not thoughtful, you'll not remember anything. The brain, the brain has uh, many functions. Number one, memory. And that brain that has memory is just to store information. And there are many people, all they have is that they store information. But the brain has another function, and that is to recollect. There are some people, they do not use their brain in this other side to recollect, to remember. The only way they use their brain is to store in information there. They never bring the information out. And the Lord wants us to use the information that we have, bring it out, analyze it. And when you analyze it, calculate. How does the other person feel? And that's what it says. And it may be that it's at the altar that you remember that your brother, your sister, your co-tenant, your co-worker, your director, your employer, your employee, your wife, your husband, your child, your father, just a neighbor has ought against you. In Genesis chapter 41, Genesis chapter 41, I'm reading from verse 9. Genesis chapter 41, reading from verse 9. It says in that verse 9, eh, this is eh, this man, the, the chief butler of Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. The thing that happened two years ago. He had forgotten Joseph. And he said, this very day, I do remember my fault. That may happen to you at the altar. You just come and then you remember. They say you remember about the person. It may be the person is not even around. Joseph was not around. You know, sometimes uh, your, your husbands or your wives travel out. And the wife is not around. And you are not talking together. Then as you sit back and you just meditate, then you say, this woman having great endurance with me when she's not around. Then all the things that have been happening, you know, they come to your mind. This woman must be a real child of God. For her to endure all this with me, she's not around, then you remember. When she is, many times when they are around, we don't remember. Your wife, it may be that when your husband has traveled and he is not around. And now you are all alone by yourself. And the ideas and the events of the days and the weeks and the months, they come rolling in your mind. Then you remember. Then you remember this. The way I talked to the man that day. Thank God this man is a Christian. How do I think he would have reacted to me? The way I spoke to him the other day. Now you recollect, now you remember when he's not there. It may be that you are packed out of a particular house you were living before. When you were there, everybody was complaining, you were complaining. Uh, that landlord was hurt. 
Now you remember. You are no more in his house, but now you remember. It may be you were in a place of work before. And when you were in that place of work, you are just demanding and demanding. We want this, we want this. And you intimidated the employer so much that everything you said you wanted, he gave you. But he was running the company at a loss because of you. Because of the demand. Eventually, the whole thing collapsed and it couldn't continue. And now that you are working in another place, now you remember. Now you remember. It may be you are in another church before you came to deeper life. And in that other church where you were before, now you remember how you dealt with some officers of that church. Now you are in this church and you are hearing the word of God. And now you have enough time to recollect how you were in the other church. Now you remember. Is it not gone? Do we have to do anything about it? Jesus said, yes, you have to do something about it. But they are not members of our church here. Yes, you still have to do something about it. But they are not even Christians. Yes, you still have to do something about it. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembrest that thy brother has ought against thee, and that thing he has against you has spoiled your relationship, has strained your relationship, it says, leave your gift at the altar. You are still consecrate it to God. Don't take it away. Don't say, I will not serve God again. You just need to settle this. And after you have settled it, you still come back. And nobody will offer the gift for you. You will still come back and offer the gift yourself. That's what Jesus said. When you remember, God will help us. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, we're reading from verse 5. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. It came to pass afterward. And what had happened is, you know, Saul, Saul was wrong. And David was right. If you are to think about it, what had young David, what has he done? This innocent boy, just a teenager, that put his life in his hand. And he went against Goliath. And then he killed Goliath. And the women of the land, they began to sing. Saul, it's not David that composed that song. David has no fault in this. It's just that the women were so happy and then they said Saul has killed his thousands and then small David tens of thousands. Don't blame David for that. He didn't compose that song. Don't blame David for that. He didn't campaign. There wasn't any, any kind of political campaign to have that song. Those women did it involuntarily by themselves. And now when Saul had that song, he became offended. He said, they have promoted the young man, the teenager, above me. What else do I have? And then he began to chase after David. Running after him, wanting to kill him. A few times, he threw the javelin at him so he can smite him to the wall. And then David... Almost got to sell pity. David saw Jonathan. said, Jonathan, my friend, what have I done to your daddy? That he's running after me like this. He wants to kill me. And Jonathan said, no, my daddy will not do anything except he tells me he doesn't want to kill you. Jonathan, you said you are my friend. I'm dying. He wants to kill me. He says, I'll go and find out. Eventually, you know, David ran away. And then Saul ran after him, left the throne, left everything, running after a small boy. And then eventually Saul was sleeping. And then David got there. And the man was so much asleep, he could have killed him. He didn't kill him. But he said, I'll show him. His royal garment, his royal apparel. He took a razor and then cut off the skirt and kept it and then went away. And then after he did that, he said, 
I have done wrong. The anointed of the Lord. It's a bad man, but it's the anointing of God is upon him. It's a persecutor, but the anointing of the Lord is upon him. How could I do that? His heart smote him. He remembered. That's the point. What have you done to all the people? And now you remember. And that's what Jesus said. When you bring your gift to the altar. And there you remember that somebody has something against you. What are we to do? That leads us to point number two. In point number two, Matthew chapter 5 verse 24. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verse 24. Here Jesus said, when you remember, you must do something about it. You cannot just say, time will erase it from my mind. Looks like I have a tender conscience. What kind of conscience is this? Always wanting to say sorry and sorry, I'm sorry to everybody. This kind of conscience will get me to trouble. They'll make me a foot match. If every time I remember this and I say sorry, the world in which we are living will make me a foot match if a sorry is too near my mouth. Jesus said, isn't it better to be a foot match and get to heaven than to be a standing rock and get to hell? Isn't it better to have a soft conscience, a tender conscience? A conscience that always feels when you hurt other people. Have a tender conscience and get to heaven. Then have a hardened conscience and then grow thick skin. And then go to hell. So Jesus said, do something about it. In verse 24, it says in verse 24, that's Matthew chapter 5 verse 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. First be reconciled to thy brother. That word first is a word of priority. It's saying this is the number one thing to be done. Don't worry about what he will say. Suppose he just says, ah, you are just coming now, you just remember now. Now you realize I am righteous and you are righteous. Whatever he will say, you want to get to heaven at all costs. And you want to a good relationship with the Lord at all costs. It shouldn't bother you, whatever name they are going to call you. If they call you names and you get to heaven. If they look down on you and you get to heaven. If they belittle you and you get to heaven, if your husband says, uh -huh, I thought you said you were sanctified all these years, now you are coming to apologize to me. Even if your husband says that and you get to heaven, and then your wife, uh, but you are a preacher now, and every time you'll be preaching, and now you are coming to apologize to me about all your preaching. What if your wife says that to you and you get to heaven? When we get to heaven, one minute in heaven, you will forget all the bad names and all the shame, all the reproach that they brought upon you. Think about heaven. And so Jesus said, the number one thing, first of all, you leave your gift at the altar and then you go first be reconciled to your brother and then after you've done that reconciliation you come and offer thy gift and the lord is telling us something look at ecclesiastes chapter 3 ecclesiastes chapter 3 we're reading verse 15 ecclesiastes 3 verse 15 that which has been is now and that which is to be has already been. And God requires that which is past. God requires that which is past. It's happened already. It's gone, it's gone. No, God requires that which is past. The cup is broken and the water is spilled on the ground. What can I do about it? God requires that which is past. 
Relationship is like an egg. And once the egg drops on the ground, the egg is broken. And the yolk inside the egg is all spilled on the ground. What else can I do? God requires that which is past. It's already happened and it's gone. I don't want to open up an old wound. I know he felt that and she felt that when I did it. If I had if, if been humble that day, I would have apologized to him on that day. But now, if the wound in his heart is healed. And if I bring it up now, I'll be opening a fresh wound. But God requires that which is past. You're thinking about God. All this logic that people use. All this kind of common sense, not scripture sense, but common sense that people use. And they rationalize to cover up. And actually, it is only because we don't seek the Lord for the grace to do what is supposed to be done. That's so why we give all those excuses. It says, and God requires that which is past. And because God requires it, that's why we do it. Nobody enjoys, you know, restitution really. We don't do restitution happily. We do it as a commitment. And we do it because that's what God requires. And when God requires something like that, then it is done. Because God requires that which is past. Here we are in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 7. And when they saw it, they all murmured saying that was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. He was gone to be guest to a man that's a sinner. That is, they were accusing Zacchaeus. That's a sinner. That's a sinner. Everybody called him names. And he could have said, well, let me already they know I'm a sinner. And if I begin to, uh, you know, talk about it now, they'll say, okay, now, he's just feeling the guilt. Didn't we say so? What if they said that about you? Didn't we say so? And then you have fellowship with Jesus. Didn't we say so? Didn't we say the man is a great sinner? He's feeling guilty now. Jesus said, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to get to your house today. And the man remembers that all the materials in the house, he stole the money to buy it. And now before Jesus get there, look at this thief. He's now confessing to Jesus. What if they say that and you get to heaven? What if they say that and you have a good relationship with the Lord? That's the important thing. What they say is not what matters. And what they think about you is not what matters. What they feel about you is not what matters. My confession might give them ammunition. And now they'll say, ah. And then they'll begin to go and talk to this. How many years do you have? Two? Are those two years filled up yet? No. Can I tell you something? Yes. What do you want to tell me? Zacchaeus came to me. And Zacchaeus said, I've been thinking about that before. I've been feeling that before. That that man is a great sinner. And he came, he came, he came to me and he said, and then that one might take it and give it to another person. What if they take the story about and you get to heaven and you have relationship with the Lord and then the guilt is no more in your heart. And the devil is not using that sin anymore. Every time you come to pray, every time you want to do something wonderful, the devil is not knocking your head anymore with that sin because you have settled it with the Lord and with the people that you offended. And then it says now in verse 8, As Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, uh, can I tell you something? It was in the public. And it was, he, he didn't have the chance to call Jesus apart and say, Jesus, please, can I have your attention? 
And then Peter was there, James was there, Matthew was there, all the others were there. Even all the public, the people that were accusing him, he has gone to be guests with him, and that says they were all there. Look at us today in our restitution, making apology. We even do ours privately now, but his was in the public. He didn't have any chance to say, Jesus, okay, since he's going to my house, when we get to the house, I'll call him to my private devotional room. And then in that private devotional room, I'll whisper in his ears, I'll say, Lord, but cover me, Lord, but protect my personality. Don't let other people hear this. This is what I had been. No. It was public. But Zacchaeus did not mind. I'm going to be a friend of Jesus. I'm going to have fellowship with Jesus. I'm going to get to heaven through Jesus. Think about that. What do I care about their taunting kind of comments about me? That's the important thing. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, therefore of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him this day, Is salvation come to this house? For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what the Lord is expecting from you and from me, from every one of us. When you remember your brother has ought against you. Before I continue, let me just show you what it does not mean. And then, now you know what it means. If your brother has something against you, tell him, get you corrected. I need to tell you what it does not mean. I need to say this because, you know, I'm, I'm teaching both preachers and leaders and workers in the church. That's the reason we need, to, we need to say this. If your brother has something against you, what he does not mean. In Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. What do you mean from verse 18? In Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 18. And for John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him. Herodias had an ought against John. Will John go to Herodias and say, I am sorry? No. Why not? That's not a personal offense. That's ministerial. John was a preacher. And John was declaring the totality of the will and the word of God. And he said, Herod, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. When Herodias had that, she had a quarrel against John. And because that's not a personal offense, you cannot go to Herodias and say, I'm sorry, I withdraw my word. No, we cannot withdraw the word. That's doctrine. And as you look at, um, uh, you look at First Kings chapter twenty-one. First Kings chapter twenty-one. I'm reading to you from verse twenty, verse twenty. And he have said to Elijah, "As thou found me, O mine enemy, he have had an ought against Elijah." But you know that's not a personal affairs. That's not in a personal relationship. Elijah was a prophet of God. And if you're a prophet of God, you'll be against Baal, against false prophets. And uh, you'll be against uh, the king Ahab that had done something wrong. And then when he now took Naboth's uh, vineyard, Elijah went there by the word of the Lord. Go and tell Ahab, what you have done is wrong. Judgment is coming. And when Elijah came, then Ahab said, I'm against you. I don't like you. I have ought against you. All the same, hear the word of the Lord. 
I want you to look at uh, this first Kings chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22. Verse 7 and verse 8. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. I have something against him. I hate him. You know, Micaiah will not come to Ahab and come and apologize. By the way, Ahab hated every true prophet of God. That's just his lifestyle. And the prophets of God, whether they are Micaiah or they are Elijah, he hates them. That's his lifestyle. And then he said, I hate him, for he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. You know, we don't, uh, we don't go about and just uh, apologizing to people because of preaching sound doctrine, preaching the word of God. Do you remember when Moses came to Egypt? And then he came to Pharaoh. He said, let my people go. And then he went to talk to the children of Israel. He said, you're coming out of this place. Pharaoh had an ought against Moses. He said, Moses. You're making these people to leave their work. We have lost man hour. Time is money. And in telling these people you are coming out of Egypt, you make them to leave their work. We are running at a loss. Moses, I have something against you. Moses did not go to apologize because of, don't get the message wrong. If you know those of us who are preachers, we step on people's toes almost every time and we preach the word of God without fear, without favor but we don't apologize for that that's doctrine, that's ministerial we're talking about personal relationship personal relationship if in your personal relationship between you and a co-tenant between you and a co-worker between you and your employer or employee between you and your family member, if that relationship has gone sour, strange, because of an angry kind of relationship, and then you now remember that your brother has ought against you, then you'll go to him and you'll settle that. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24, verse 16. Acts, chapter 24. Verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious void of offense toward God and toward men. Exercising ourselves every time to have a conscious void of offense towards God and towards men. We come to point number three, reaction towards adversaries in the world. Reaction towards adversaries in the world. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence. Till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Let's look at that verse 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly, immediately, without wasting time. Settle that relationship immediately. Agree with thine adversary quickly. And there are young people here, and I need to make you understand the kind of adversary the Lord is talking about here. This is a person you had had, this is how a strange relationship with a co tenant, a landlord, an employee, an employer, a friend, just a neighbor. That's the adversary here. There are some other kinds of adversaries. And the Lord is not telling you to agree with 
those other kinds of adversaries quickly. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth. Let me show you. In First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. We're reading from verse 8. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's an adversary you never agree with. So, when you see, agree with thine adversary quickly. Don't generalize. Ask yourself, which adversary? This is one. It says, your adversary, the devil. Verse 9, whom resist, don't agree with him, resist him steadfast in the faith. So, we learn, number one, the devil is an adversary. And you will never come into agreement with the devil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. A great door of evangelism. A great door of ministry is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries trying to stop that ministry. Trying to close that door of evangelization. Are you to agree with them? No. That's not the kind of adversary you agree with. Rightly divide the word of truth. And then we're told in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that ye stand in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the face of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them is an evident token of perdition, in nothing terrified by your adversaries. That is, those adversaries that do not want you with the same mind, and with one spirit, and with focus and concentration, glorify the Lord, and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. You will not agree with such an adversary. You'll continue with your commitment and consecration. And then he tells us in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, we're reading from verse 12. Here the Lord Jesus Christ himself talking to his own disciples. And he's talking about some adversaries too. In Luke chapter 21, I'm reading to you from verse 12, 21, 12, Luke. And before all these... They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Certainly, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom that all your adversaries shall not be able to gain say or resist. These adversaries you don't agree with them. When it says, agree with your adversary quickly, you have a ministry. And you have the gospel. And the Lord has given you the heavenly vision. And you should be able to say, I'm so committed to this heavenly vision. Oh, King Agrippa, I am not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What if there are adversaries that want to go against that vision? And then the Bible says, agree with an adversary quickly. No, that's a different kind of adversary. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And I'm reading there from verse 7. Acts 13, verse 7. Which was of the deputy of the country, Sir just Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God, but he limas the sorcerer. For so is his name by interpretation, was to them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, then Saul, 
who also is called Paul, filled of the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. That word enemy means adversary. Thou enemy, opposer, adversary of all righteousness. Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Paul did not agree with the sorcerer. The sorcerer is an enemy. An opposer of the gospel is an enemy, an adversary. And when it says, agree with an adversary quickly, it's not talking about those who want to turn the minds of people off from believing the gospel. In verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Let's go to the Old Testament. At this point of the adversary, you need to know the kinds of adversaries you don't agree with. Esther, in Esther chapter 7, Esther, we're looking at chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 3. Esther chapter 7, verse 3. Then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please thee, if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not contravail the king's damage. Esther was saying, we're dying, O king, I'm going to be killed. And all my people, the Jews, are going to be killed. If they sold us for bond men and bond women, I would not even have told. Although if they sell us for bond men and bond women, and then the damage to the king will be so much. You lose a lot of faithful citizens, loyal citizens. And then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he? And where is he? That does presume in his heart to do so, to kill all the Jews. And Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Somebody that wants to wipe out your family. It doesn't mean agree with the adversary quickly, all right? You want to kill my family? Here we are. These are all the daughters I have. These are all the sons I have. And here is my wife. Come. Here is my wife. You want to kill us? Here we are. Because the Bible says, agree with an adversary quickly and let them kill everybody. No. You see, this A man, he wanted to kill all the Jews. That's the adversary. And then Esther said, O king, deliver us. Look at our condition here. And it's because she cried out. That's why the Jews did not perish. Let's come to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And here I'm reading to you from verse... I'll first of all read verse 2 and then I'll go to verse 6. And he had two wives. That's El Canaan. And this, uh, uh, when it says he had two wives, the name of the first was Anna. That's the right wife. And the name of the other, Penina. And then Penina had two children, but Anna had no children. Verse her adversary also provoked her to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. The adversary, there is a second wife. And the second wife is always saying, uh huh, you are prayerful, but no child. You say, my husband loves you, and you are the first wife. Are we going to eat first wife without any child? First wife, first wife, and there's no child. I am second wife, and you say I'm the wrong woman, and you know, I have children. 
taunting her, teasing her, torturing her, provoking her. And then she's referred to as adversary. Should Anna then just agree with Penina or Penina? And just say, okay, since you are the second wife and you're having children, I agree with my adversary quickly. No, you'll pray against that strange woman and your prayer and my prayer with you will drive away the strange woman in Jesus' name. <laughs> or drive them away. We're not going to say, agree with thine adversary quickly. You must understand the Bible. If you don't understand the Bible, you'll just you put your neck under a yoke, under a captivity, and you say, I'm trying to obey the Bible because it says agree with an adversary quickly. Not like that. Come back now. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly. You know, it's, it's, we're coming from verse 23. This is the brother, this is the neighbor that you had some discussion with, some disagreement with. And then in your interaction, there has been some exchange of words that uh, kind of uh, that involved anger. And now you feel, how could I act like that and talk like that to him or to her? And now you know he has something, an ought against you. He's talking of normal, personal relationship. And in that personal relationship, he feels hurt. And that's why he's like, you know, an adversary now. His back is to you. He's not looking at you face to face in good fellowship anymore. And that's why Jesus said, why don't you reconcile with him quickly? Get to him quickly. And bridge that gap quickly. And just apologize. And you confess your first come with humility. And come with surrender. And even if you are going to be cheated, don't mind about that. Agree with an adversary quickly. That's what it means. And then it says, while you are still in the way with him. While you can still see him. Well, it is not difficult to be in the way and say, can I have your attention? Can I speak to you? This thing that, you know, happened the other day, uh, can, let's talk this thing over. Don't let us, you know, continue like this and sleep over this thing. Nights and weeks and months and years. Don't let us do like this. Let's sit down here and settle this matter. While you're still in the way, waste him. And then he says, lest he hands you over unto the judge now he's talking about if that person is not a christian brother and then he takes this matter out of hand and he goes to the court that's an adversary in the world if he's in the church you had disagreement with somebody it's not going to go to the court did you hear of peter taking john to court did you hear of the apostles when James and John, when they went to Jesus, give us this favor, one to sit here, the other to sit there. They are not against one another. Because when the other ten heard, they were full of indignation. James, John, you of all people, you are thinking of something like that in your heart. You on this side, you on that side, how about me? We came here to sell granuts. What do you think we are here for? They had ought against them. And then Jesus called them and reconciled them. They didn't go to court. But if you have an ought, if somebody has an ought against you, but he's not a believer, and he goes to the court, don't allow him to get to the court. Settle it here. Because the money you are going to give to the lawyers, to the attorney, might even be more than the money you are trying to you are trying to fight on. Settle with him before he takes you to court because you may not be able to come out of the detention, out of the prison until you pay the last farthing. That's what the Lord is saying. He's telling us what, what we're told in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Reading from verse 17. Romans 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. All men. 
It's talking about the one on the street, the one in your house, the one in the bus, and the one in your office, the one everywhere. Live peaceably with all men. Some of them are not Christians and they may head for the court. If there's something you are resolving, you're not able to resolve. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. For the sake of heaven, follow peace with all men. For the sake of your fellowship and relationship with God, follow peace with all men. You know the society in which we live is a fighting society. The house in which you live may be a kind of battleground. The kitchen where you cook, lady, may be a kind of battleground. The bathroom where you take your bath, you know, in that accommodation, having many people may be like almost a battleground. Even the schools we go and the staff room with all those other teachers and, and the people there, it may be like a battleground. And then when you get to the bus, I'm sitting down the ship for me now. Do you want to occupy the whole seat? What kind of man are you? And then begins to abuse you. You've never even seen one another. Follow peace with all men. If we are to react to everything we see on the street, everything we hear in the house, Everything we hear from, you know, sometimes you're married and it's these uh, brothers and sisters of your husband, of your wife, and they make life tough and difficult for you. Follow peace with all men. If you cannot say anything good, just keep quiet, just smile. Just smile. They call you names. Just smile. Why are you smiling? One of these days you will get to heaven. One of these days all these things will be over. One of these days all these insults and assaults will be over. That's why you are smiling. Just smile it off and follow peace with all men. They shout at you. Smile. They put pressure on you. Just smile. And they call you names that you know I don't deserve this. Just smile for the sake of heaven. Because when we get to heaven and everything is over, one minute in heaven will more than repay all the things we went through on earth. And thank God we are getting there. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's rise up and pray. You want to commit yourself to the Lord. You want to say, Lord, here I am. Look over your life. All the things that have happened. All the things that are happening between you and your fellow man. Between you and your fellow woman, between you and the tenants, between you and the workers, between you and the employers, between you and the employees, all the things that happen that stir something like fire from your stomach, from your heart, emotion bursting out. Why can't we come to the throne of grace and say, Lord, must we be just bursting like this and fuming like this every time? Isn't there the balm of Gilead available? Isn't there the grace of God available that will make us to follow peace with all men, all men, and some of those men are like lions. Some of those men are fiery, violent. And yet you say, follow peace with all men. There must be a way in Christ. There must be a way through grace. There must be a way through the experience of salvation and through our fellowship with the Lord. There must be a way to follow peace with all men. 
those who deliberately hurt you there must be a way to follow peace with them otherwise if there were no way the lord will not say follow peace with all men and if you remember that your brother has ought against you for the sake of heaven for the sake of the final place you want to spend eternity. Leave there your gift at the altar. And go. It will take humility. And it takes humility to get to heaven. It will take self-denial. And it takes self-denial to get to heaven. It will take submission to the word of God before you can do this. And it takes submission to the word of God before you can get to heaven. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't be too serious about just offering gifts and offering gifts and offering gifts. When your relationship with your fellow man is not all right. Or the co-tenants. Or the daughter of your landlord. With that difficult wife of your landlord. Looks like every time she sleeps, when she wakes up in the morning, she has a bad vocabulary she learns in the dream. And she wants to use that on you. And yet you are to follow peace with all those women. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Leave your gift at the altar. Your worship at the altar. Your service at the altar. And go first. Be reconciled to thy brother. A true believer is minded in going to heaven. Will have a tender conscience. A soft heart, a willing mind, reconcile with your fellow man. You know he's complaining about you, you hear it. You know he's complaining about you, you know it. You know how many times he has told your friend, you know so and so. You know what he has done. You know what he is doing. You know that he has ought against you. And your relationship is strange. Be a Christian. Leave thy gift at the altar. And go reconcile with your brother. Lord, I will. Tell him to give you the grace. Lord, I will. Pride will close the door of heaven against the proud. Hardness of heart will close the door of heaven against hard-hearted people. Follow Christ. Follow his word. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there at the altar rememberest, that thy brother has ought against thee. Leave there thy gift at the altar. If you have a bad relationship with your wife, your worship is unacceptable, unprofitable, unrewardable. A bad relationship with the tenants 
I was fighting. I was frowning. No peace between you and the co-tenants. In the office, you have no friend. You have no acquaintance. Everybody has something against you. And you don't know how to humble yourself. And reconcile with those co-workers. How will you get your heaven? If you bring your gift to the altar. A fellow student. Exchanging bad words. He abused me first. And I'm not just a dense fellow. I have to show him that I too. I know those bad words I can use on him. Go and reconcile with your fellow students. Be a man of peace. A woman of peace. Be a child, a teenager of peace. That's the evidence of the grace of God. It will take that grace Reconcile with well, that fellow student. You know that teacher has art against you. You think he doesn't know. He knows you are the head and the champion and the ringleader of that conspiracy. You think he doesn't know. He knows. Only he cannot talk because he's afraid of the school gang. Reconcile. Don't be a troublemaker anymore. Reconcile. If you bring your gift to the altar, the altar may be the altar of your own home, morning devotion. And right there, the morning devotion, the Lord reminds you. You know, when you tell your wife, pray. And she says, my husband, I don't want to pray today. Just, you just pray. Whatever prayer you pray, that's enough. You know why she's saying that? You know why she's saying that? And when you're looking for her and she's hiding in the bathroom or hiding in the toilet, just then you open the door and she's wiping her eyes of tears. You know what's happening? You know she has something against you thinking, is this the place I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this man? Doesn't have any feeling for any woman. She has a lot against you. Reconcile. Don't just keep on in ministry, worship and service. And it's that reconciliation that will open the door of heaven that reconciliation that will pave the way to heaven. That's what Jesus said. And he said, if you don't reconcile, then that adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge of heaven and earth. What that is saying is, Lord, you know this man is hurting me, torturing me, crushing me. But you are the father of the fatherless. I have no hell. I cannot defend myself. Lord, I leave him in your hand. You said vengeance is yours. I hand him over to your hand. That's what it means. And then the judge, if he casts you into prison, you'll not come out there until you pay the uttermost farthing. And there's no way you can pay for that on the other side of eternity. 
Today is the day to reconcile. Today is the day to say, Lord, I will obey your word. Your spirit is reminding me. As to what you do. Lord, grant me your grace. Grant me the humility. Grant me the submission, the yieldedness to your word. Lord, I will do it. And the joy that fills your heart when it's done. The release you have in the spirit when it's done. The freedom that you have in your soul when it's done. And then you're free once again. A free relationship. Good interaction. The middle wall of partition is broken down. Now there's joy. Rest of mind. Peace in your soul. And there's no fear of what eternity holds anymore. You are right with God and you are right with your fellow man. Let him do it. Let us come to the throne of grace that we may obtain help in the time of need. He's able to help to other people. He'll help you to make right your way with everyone and then it becomes your principle your lifestyle following peace with all men every day and holiness without which no man shall see the lord